Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Information Command Center. I am Lisa Joseph, and we're here for a discussion on COVID-19 protocols and the election campaign for 2021. The date for the pending general elections that was announced on the 5th of July by Prime Minister Honorable Alan Shastny. That date given was the 26th of July, 2021, with nomination day set for the 16th of July. General elections in St. Lucia is always underpinned by lots of mass crowd activity. Certainly, individuals coming out to show their support for their various uh, parties of choice. And it also means lots of interaction taking place, whether it be at the constituency level, it is on a house-to-house -house basis, or persons just gathering with on street corners having conversations relating to the general elections. However, for us here in St. Lucia, we hold in a general election at a very, very precarious time for the country in the backdrop of COVID-19. The pandemic is still on, and the numbers in St. Lucia are still staggering, although we realized a sort of lull in the numbers or a reduction in our transmission rates. In order for there to have been the general elections in a safe environment, a number of protocols were drawn up and that was agreed to by various stakeholders, including all political parties. We'll be having that discussion with some of those who are the sort of gatekeepers where those COVID-19 protocols and the election campaign is concerned. With me in studio is the Commissioner of Police, Mr. Milton Daisy the Deputy Chief Environmental Health Officer, Mrs. Cheryl Eugene St. Romain, and the Chief Fire Officer, Mr. Joseph Joseph. On July 12th, just two days ago, the uh, Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Sean Belmont George, indicated that over the last 14 days, 114 new cases of COVID-19 had been reported, bringing a total of active cases in country to 127. The daily infection rate for the past week has been at 4.3 per 100,000 per day, with an average of seven cases per day. And certainly, the day after, on the 13th of July, the country had already recorded, recorded 14 new cases of COVID-19. This has drawn concern and it is concerning, especially given the images that were seen after national motorcades by both of major political parties. And so we are here to discuss how we can maintain our safe environment while exercising our franchise and our democratic rights. Let me turn my attention to Mr. Milton Daisy our Commissioner of Police. Let me just ask, sir, in terms of being able to ensure the protocols, what has been the difficulty for the Royal St. Lucia Police Force? Okay, um, first of all, the difficulty is um, in relation to actually enforcing the protocols. We had protocols, um, campaign protocols um, set, set out. Uh, the, all the major parties, actually three of them, will present and agreed to, to the protocols. However, during the activities, we uh, realized that um, there was little co compliance to the protocols, especially the motorcades, where um, persons were to remain in their vehicles and so on. Um, I, a little further down, I will go over the um, protocols for especially the motorcades. And, um, but one, one of um, which I shall mention now is that persons are not, were not supposed to get off their vehicles um, during that uh, motorcade. You were to proceed, it's a motorcade, it's not a um, political meeting, it's a motorcade and they were supposed to proceed on the route of the um, motorcade. However, we saw um, vehicles diverting um, other than the route that was specified in the license granted by the Commission of Police, because um, there's a specified route and, and so on on that day. So this was one of the issues that we saw. We also saw that persons, other protocols like wearing of masks, 
yes, yeah, some persons had it, some had it under the chin, um, some were not wearing it at all. So um, these things were in the um, protocols for the campaigns and persons agreed to doing it. Um, we, and the reason for that is um, that the campaign, we realized the campaign would not take the usual form as other elections because um, during the other elections we did not have COVID to deal with. So um, we had to take the health aspect into consideration um, so that um, we could have granted permission to have some com um, campaigning. However, it was reduced. It was um, in a controlled manner. I know um, the CMO yeah, had a very had stern warnings to the, um, to the parties so that they would be informing their, um, their supporters of the protocols and reminding them what they need to do and so on. And everybody agreed to doing it, yes. But I suppose as with anything else, as with the police enforcing, mm -hmm. when it comes to being able to manage mass crowds, it becomes quite a difficult Yeah, it is, it is um, difficult, especially with the motorcade where you have, um, say, uh, probably vehicles expanding to um, over a mile, mm -hmm. where you have um, police officers at different locations. But however, persons take the opportunity when there's no officer mm -hmm. around to do things. Um, I, and not just for health issues, there were security issues there also, which um, some of them, the result being an, uh, a collision between vehicles, um, I'll not say an accident, it was collision caused um, by person's behavior, the manner of driving, and we saw that. Um, so the need now is um, for persons to observe the rules, the protocols, and so on. And um, having seen the, over the weekend what had happened, we took the decision to bring in the main players in the various parties, the persons who organized the campaigns, the, the um, persons who organized the meetings. And they agreed with us that um, the national motorcade should be banned. And so it, there was consensus among the, the, the police, um, including the traffic department, the persons who represented the party, and so on. So the, um, it was agreed without any issues that we would burn the um, national motorcades. However, what um, we agreed um, is that we would continue with the community motorcades. Um, constituency motorcades so so that persons would remain for example if it is in um, Castries Central just an example it would remain within the um, jurisdiction of Castries Central so that you would have less vehicles you'd have less participation and so on however your their message would be sent out so so we'll talk about how that differs to the mm -hmm. national motorcade although you've alluded to it but we'll get a little deeper into yeah. that before i bring in the deputy chief environmental health officer let me say hello to the chief fire officer uh, joseph joseph where does your I, I don't think many people would think about the fire service mm -hmm. the fire ambulance service at the time of election but you do play a critical role outline that for us okay well thank you good morning to all um, yes, uh, certainly the fire service plays a critical role. Um, wherever, whenever we have, um, you know, emergencies, <laughs> you know, once once there are emergencies, the fire service uh, certainly needs to respond. And we too are concerned about some of the um, actions we see, some of the unsafe practices um, we see, especially with um, the, the the campaigning and on the and what is happening. Um, at, at those motorcades. And um, like uh, Mr. Daisy was saying, um, the, some, of the, some of those things we see happening, um, like, you know, the, the persons not wearing masks and so on, um, um, the number of persons um, in, in, in vehicles and, and some of them in, in trucks, in open trucks, large numbers of persons in open trucks and so on. Um, the, the possibility of having an accident, you know, when you have um, so many vehicles 
is always greater. And um, we have to look at the island's capacity to handle, you know, mass casualty incident. Because um, if you have an accident involving one of those uh, trucks, here, uh, uh, and of course for, for us, um, any incident involving more than 10 persons is considered a mass, ca mass casualty incident. And uh, in some cases you see in excess of 20 persons on, on one vehicle. So just imagine you have an accident involving, you know, um, one of these vehicles, it will be, you know, overwhelming for all, all, all our services. You know, the hospitals, uh, I mean, we do not have sufficient ambulances to transport, you know, that uh, many persons, you know, in, in this one incident. Um, so, I mean, there are certainly challenges uh, that are uh, brought um, to the fore as it, as it relates to these kind of practices. Now, in, in terms of if you were to re respond to an eventuality at one of these mass crowd um, election events, how does the presence of COVID change the dynamics of how you would normally respond? Right. So, okay, right now, um, most of our EMS responses are can be considered hazmat responses because, um, you know, whereas um, pre-COVID we would have made responses with just our ordinary uniforms and so on. Right now we have to, you know, do it in, in PPE um, to make those responses. And um, just imagine um, you have a situation where, you know, you have large numbers of persons involved in accidents. We have, you know, to provide a PPE for all of the, the persons responding. We have to get ambulances <coughs> um, to a service um, uh, this emergency uh, request and um, we have a limited number of them mm -hmm. and just imagine it's, it's in one area on the island uh, you we may have to you know um, use the, uh, the the services of ambulances at other stations so you would find that uh, wherever you know they make a response that area which the the, the ambulance covers um, is is it well, remains without ambulance coverage for the period. So you see the, the, the challenge. Um, so like I said, I mean, we need to take a note, note of, of, of these, um, these situations. And, and besides, you know, we have other emergencies to attend to. Because while that is happening, we can have a fire, you know, we can have a, maybe an, air, an aircraft crashing on, on. Because I mean, we, we provide no, not just a f um, domestic fire, and on EMS responses, but we, we are responsible for several other, you know, emergency and non-emergency functions. So any anything that puts unnecessary stress on our department, you know, is uh, one that we would discourage. Let's bring in the Deputy Chief uh, Environmental Health Officer, Mrs. Cheryl uh, Eugene St. Romain. The COVID-19 protocols for the campaign of an election campaign uh, came into effect uh, June 29, 2021. And as I said earlier, there was an agreement, a consensus across the board between all parties on, on what that would be. And want to be able to go through some of the critical elements of that, uh, Ms. St. Romain, but let me get to your sentiment though. I know that the talking point definitely is all of those images that we saw coming out of the motorcades um, on Sunday last. For you, just uh, someone critically involved, intimately involved in St. Lucia's COVID-19 response and for public health, what were your immediate thoughts when you saw those images? Oh my, <laughs> that was it, oh my. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's really disheartening um, considering that like um, Mr. Dizzy, the commissioner said, there was consensus. And the protocols, we have protocols for elections and we have protocols specific to the campaign, pre, during and post, yeah? And the persons responsible were in session where those protocols were presented to them. They knew every component of it and they had the opportunity from that then on to go, you know, um, educate the, 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 the um, base, the, the individuals that would be involved. And even the organizers of Take for instance the um, the motorcade, okay? Because there are specific guidelines as to what should and should not happen. And to see 
that revelation on Sunday was really disheartening. Let's, uh, and of course, because of the implications, and I think that sometimes, um, no, sort of carnival-like atmosphere at the uh, motorcades, during the motorcade at several um, uh, points. But I think too that perhaps because the, the country had experienced a sort of quiet with the numbers in our in, uh, COVID-19 infection, that somehow it was out of sight and out of mind for many of the individuals there. Uh, and like you rightly said, it was very, very disheartening and very worrying to have seen the number of people uh, with drink in hand, and that's something else we'll be talking about, with drink in hand and certainly um, throwing caution to the wind when it came to how the mask, they had the mask, but the mask were not being utilized in the proper way and not being worn at all. So Ms. Uh, St. Romain, I would like you to take us through some of the pertinent um, sections of the uh, protocols. Um, let's start, if you will, with the campaign period. Okay. And give us an idea, because mm -hmm. the, the, the protocols are very specific all the way down to office meetings being held. So just to give the, the, the listening public an opportunity to understand how much consideration went into and detailing went into the protocols. If you can just go over that with us, um, some of the key points uh, that were outlined in the constituency office meetings, if you will, if you have okay. that before you. Okay, whilst um, the period was short, and like you rightly said, um, the green light was given on the 29th, and um, immediately following that, which just a few days before the first a mass event <laughs> was 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 um, implemented rather but what should have happened because we have a category that says pre-election campaign and is specific to the political party and administration so what should have happened every political party should have presented to the environmental health division a copy of their response plan and what the protocol what protocols do is um, it, it, it serves as a, a, a guideline, yeah? And what you need to do is to look at your own individual um, scenario, and then you prepare a response plan to that. Stay with us. When we come back, we'll continue the conversation on the COVID-19 protocols and election campaign for 2021. We can win this war. Get vaccinated. We're taking our life back. Experts we trust Take two doses Take our life back Vaccinate for you For yours For us Let's take our life back with the safe and effective AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine. The mobile vaccination drive is coming to you. Visit the Ministry of Health and Wellness and Bureau of Health Education Facebook pages for more information. Let's take our life back. Vaccinate for you, for yours, for us. Get vaccinated. This message is brought to you by the Bureau of Health Education of the Ministry of Health and Wellness and this station. And welcome back. We're continuing our discussion with the Deputy Chief Environmental Health Officer, Cheryl uh, Eugene St. Romain, as well as the Commissioner of Police, Mr. Milton Daisy, and the Chief Fire Officer, Joseph Joseph, as we do a rundown of the COVID-19 protocols for the election campaign 2021. Before we went to break, I was going to pose the question to Ms. St. Romain regarding uh, the protocols and how detailed uh, the protocol was given and and being finalized upon consensus um, by all parties involved to give us a sense of what is contained and how what the details of the uh, protocol documented yes. thank you lisa again um the the document the protocols establishes several components of the election period okay so you have the pre-election phase, which will be the campaign, and it also went, goes further to categorize as well the different components. So there's a door-to-door, um, -door, that, that's called the canvassing. There's a set of protocols for that. There's um, 
protocols for meetings, rallies, motorcades, and constituency meetings. So all these areas are articulated there and um, with guidelines um, presented with them. Um, before you go any further, can you give us the, the sort of uh, indication as to what must happen, especially for the door-to-door? -door? Because in as much as we've seen the numbers out there at the motorcades and the little uh, uh, meetings, constituency meetings, a vast number of St. Lucians are remaining home, and we do see the canvassing taking place within the various communities. So what needs to happen at that level for the individuals who are at home and for the canvassers themselves? Okay. So just let me run through um, some of the guidelines there. It says that people conducting door-to-door -door campaigns must practice risk mitigation measures to limit person-to-person -person interaction and mitigate risk from transferring leaflets. So um, what we are saying here is instead of the interaction where you be pre-COVID, you would actually go to the person's doorstep, have a, a discussion with them and then hand them the whatever leaflet or information that you want to leave with them. We are recommending that um, that information be left at an appropriate place, maybe at the doorstep, maybe somewhere that they can collect after. Um, we are also recommending, and that is all the time that persons wear masks or appropriate first face covering or pro other protective equipment. We are recommending that they adopt ways of delivering material, well I said that, that reduce unnecessary touching and that is leaving materials outside the door rather than handing them directly to the residents. And even for those receiving, so you, a canvasser places material at my doorstep, my balcony, um, under a stone, whatever it is. Be I am coming outside of my house. Should I now wait until the individuals have totally cleared my yard, my space, and then for me to go and see what that material is? You can do that, and also you need to practice proper hand hygiene. So after you have handled that material and you have gone through it and satisfy yourself with whatever information is there, you would then proceed to put it in an appropriate place because you know the virus um, remains on, on surfaces for a period of time, but also you need to practice proper hand washing before and after handling that material. And that's the important thing. Always wash the hands once that is done. Okay. And uh, what else during the door-to-door -door campaigning? Um, we're asking as much as possible. So you, you, you practice because Instead of, well, I think um, prior to COVID, persons would actually go into the homes of persons. Well, that is when you are invited. But we are recommending that you do it in an open air environment. So if the person is able to come out, you have that interaction outside with them. Okay, instead of going in where the, the space is limited and, and you, you know, you. you um, and I think that would, not allowed. that would be very important as well because we do have. Uh, the uh, number of uh, shut-ins uh, in and around St. Lucia, elderly um, persons, uh, senior citizens who, for one reason or the other, may not be able to walk and go to the door to, to, to perhaps stand in the doorway and speak with that canvasser from a distance. Mm -hmm. So it would be impressed upon the canvassers now to understand that if you do have individuals who are in that critical um, uh, risk bracket, mm -hmm that certain measures must be followed. Must be followed. So in most of these shut-ins, they have somebody, a caregiver, so you interact with that caregiver on behalf of the individual. Or if there is no way that, that or if there's no caregiver there, you, you try your best to limit your, the exposing the person and yourself to any of, of um, the conditions. Mm -hmm. And now we come to the very tricky part which is the outdoor open air meetings or large public meetings. What obtains under those? So under that, we have um, at all times throughout, you need to ensure that all applicable sections of the COVID-19 Prevention Control Act is implemented at all times. So um, wearing of masks, we ask that persons wear masks of, of appropriate coverings, face coverings, sorry, by followers and all candidates on stage. 
Um, we ask that you ensure and maintain physical distances between persons on stage. So you ensure that you, 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 you um, adhere to the six foot distancing. Also, before and after persons between um, making their presentations, we ask that um, all mics, lecterns are sanitized after each speaker. Um, you provide adequate measures to facilitate hand hygiene within candidates on stage and within the crowd as much as, you're, as possible because you know in the crowd that can pose a challenge so as much as possible and you have that constant um, reminders of people to maintain um, the, the social distancing to wear the mask and as much as possible if they have to be interacting or, or maybe going to the um, facility toilet facility that they you know um, practice the hand washing and so on so that that reminder must be constant throughout the meeting but these in terms of the numbers then because everyone will believe well it's outdoor so any number can apply what applies in terms of the numbers of people allowed at these uh, open outdoor open air meetings? It's it's almost unrealistic to give a number, given so that is why we are advocating for open air. So um, we have the open air meeting, but the constant advisories, the constant reminders, that is what is important. And what we had asked as well is to designate an individual. So each party designates an individual, almost like a COVID officer or somebody. Yes, so they can, one or two, depending on the crowd, because they would know, to go through the crowd. So you can, you know, as reminders to ensure that persons are in adherence to, 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 to the protocols. You may need an, abs an absolute <laughs> heavy team there. <laughs> and I'll turn to a uh, uh, police commissioner, uh, Daisy, into now being able to enforce and police these protocols at the open air meetings what takes place in that regard for the police force do you do you need a list in advance for you to be able to give permission for for the open air meetings okay um for every uh, public meeting in fact the um, law provides that the w the applicant provide a list of the speakers to um, when um, applying for, for the permission. And that was not because of COVID. It has always been the law. So that the, um, the police would be aware of how many persons that you have speaking on the day in question, the duration of your meeting, and so on, and that we, the police wouldn't get any surprise that um, you would get somebody who, who may not be permitted to speak because of what generally the person um, normally communicates and so on. So, but at most times, or I should say at all times, that the speakers are allowed and um, permission is granted. Actually, the um, office of the commissioner, what we have decided, especially now with the few, few days left, for the campaign that um, we will not um, deny permission to hold any meeting. However, um, guidelines, you need to follow the guidelines and so on. If, um, how, do, how, would you, uh, how would you be able to enforce those guidelines and ensure that they're being adhered to? Um, because I say that given because of the nature of COVID-19, what it has, how it has impacted every aspect of our lives, including the general election process, it will mean now that you may need to have several uh, m community meetings taking place all at once yes. in order for the parties to believe that the message is getting out. So how does that place the um, additional stress on the resources and is the intent to be able to police all of these community meetings? Actually, um, the community meetings, we would be policing them and that is why uh, we we believe that the rallies, the national rallies, were not permitted. So we do not have a rally where persons from all constituencies are gathering. So you have the cross, cross constituency and then um, issues with if there is a, an outbreak. So, um, so the more meetings you have a day, once we can provide the security, the better for um, Ministry of Health, I should say, because um, 
if you have um, 17 meetings, you have less mm -hmm. less persons congregated. However, if the less um, the the less meetings you have, the more persons you would find attending, and this is what we would be um, discouraging persons from. So, no um, national rally would be permitted. In fact. Um, there would be no application for it because that was one of the things that was agreed when we brought the um, the, represent the representatives from the parties um, together. Mr. Joseph, how does that, that little bit of good news, how does it <laughs> now, how has it been received by, by the uh, fire service? The, no national rallies to, to be worried about, but you do have the various constituency meetings or even bring it down to the community levels. There are several of them. So traditionally, what would occur um, at these meetings for the uh, fire and ambulance service? Do you attend all of them and have a, a unit stationed? And how would you do it differently this time? Um, well, for our department, it's not practical to um, have persons posted at all of those meetings. Um, but if we do get an application from one of the political parties to send an ambulance to maybe a large meeting, um, then we, we do so. But I think um, right now, on, on this one, we, we are living through a pandemic. And I think we should, you know, let it, let it be known that we, we are living through a pandemic and our, our actions should um, suggest that we are. So I think um, we could make use of, of the, the technology that has before us. I mean, use um, live streaming and all of that. And you can get all of what is being said at the meeting without leaving your home. So I think it's, it's really a, a case of persons taking personal responsibility for their own safety. And uh, I, no, notwithstanding the number of protocols we have, we will get breaches in, 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 in some cases. And I think um, if we now take personal responsibility for our safety, we can perhaps um, withdraw from some of, of the, some of those things that we see when persons are, are not wearing masks to keep, you know, your, your safe distance away from them and, and all of this. Thing. So, like I said, I mean, the, the fire department will do its best in terms of, of assisting in, in uh, managing the situation. However, like I said, we have our limitations. And so personal responsibility must really come into play. Yes, certainly. Personal responsibility. Uh, Commissioner Daisy, we began speaking about the motorcades and yes. we've indicated that the motorcades will no longer be held. That has been agreed across the board by all parties. But there was a sense that um, perhaps we would believe that the, there were no protocols and if protocols had been established, perhaps it was a little too loose, wasn't communicated. Can you just give us an idea, give us a full understanding of what the protocols uh, for the motorcade, uh, the were motorcades were? Okay, uh, yes. Um, so for mo motorcades, the organizers should reduce the need for in-person coordination by providing written communication or telephone communication, send out a blast to um, supporters of the, the um, protocols even before because um, generally it's expected that persons would be briefing the participants before. But if you do it even prior to assembling, so it would um, reduce the need for persons to be going to every individual and say, okay, you must observe protocols. Then there's the number of persons in vehicles must comply with COVID-19 protocols. So, for example, if your bus is licensed to carry um, 10 passengers during the um, COVID, the COVID period, mm -hmm. yeah, you must comply with that. And one of the things that we saw um, was the overcrowding of those buses. So you, your bus, you must comply with the number of persons in the vehicle. Also, um, individuals are advised not to gather outside of their vehicles before or after the motorcade. So um, normally that is one of the things that we see persons gather, they speak to friends and so on. So these are the things that causes um, the um, 
contamination. These are the things that causes um, the virus to spread. Mm -hmm. So um, if you remain in your vehicle, there's um, a reduced chance of you um, getting the virus uh, transmitted. Participants, and that one is um, very important, participants should remain in their vehicles during the entire event and not congregate outside of the vehicle. And persons agreed to that. Everybody had an opportunity to um, give feedback and so on or what they think should be. Everybody agreed to that. If it's a motorcade, that it is a motorcade. It's not a, a, it's not a um, political meeting. It is not a party. It is a motorcade and these um, things were agreed upon. So we are going around the island that persons would be driving their vehicle and then vehicles going in convoy until the end. Each vehicle participating in the motorcade should be comprised of individuals from the same extended bubble family. And um, so each vehicle in that motorcade should as far as possible that it should be um, should have members of the same extended bubble or family again to reduce the risk right um, it's also stated that and you must have sanitizers in the vehicle vehicles should not drive parallel to each other at any time and should proceed in single file through the motorcade route we also saw that vehicles will drive in parallel to each other that in itself even without the covid protocols that is an offense you cannot drive parallel to another vehicle while it's good except if you were um, overtaken and it's clear okay um, yeah. participants should disperse immediately following the motorcade mm -hmm. uh, okay the motorcade has ended you should go about your um, your business so we cannot after a motorcade it was not um, it's not permitted to have to hold any other session after the motorcade. Um, the rules of the road must be followed at all times, and that is the rules of driving, the um, traffic rules, you must observe it. And the relevant regulations with respect to events, parades must be followed. Mask or appropriate face covering must be worn at all times. So all these will um, protocols for motorcades okay. and um, what we saw um, over the weekend was um, persons having community motorcades and join then joining the national motorcade which um, of course we were not um, prepared we were the police we were not prepared to handle it at, because we know that permission is given for motorcade to go around the island so um, our resources were deployed in that regard. So um, there were surprises, what I said, to the police where you find um, you at a particular location and vehicles and, and a motorcade is coming in the opposite direction. And I must remind persons that um, the law makes provision for application three days before the event. And this is to assist us with our planning. So that we would, um, if, um, if there is already an event in one area, that we could um, advise as to another location or another day. Because so did we you have like applications before you, for all participating parties in the uh, motorcades on Sunday? We had um, an application for a general motorcade to um, the Round the Island motorcade. However, persons left constituencies together and to join with the um, hope of joining the, the main motorcade. And that posed right, a that challenge. Right, that posed, yes, a challenge. So how does the constituency, at the constituency level, because we've done away with the national motorcade and we've decided that the con at the constituency level, motorcades are being sanctioned. It's okay for that. So. How does that really differ? Ms. St. Romain, you want to give us an idea as to why the constituency level from a public health standpoint, we'll get back to Commissioner in a moment, from a public health standpoint, why is that a better medium? Um, let me first say, thank you, Lisa, but let me first say that every one of those guidelines that the Commissioner articulated still should be adopted for the constituency meetings, yeah? every single one of them. 
Um, with respect to the constituency meetings, it is more confined to just the community, okay? Providing they remain, well, not providing, but they, they should remain within the boundaries of the constituency. So in that case, you do not have much traversing where persons coming from Viewfort would, would, would end up in, in um, Castro Central or Babano or somewhere like that. So whatever the constituency a motorcade would be just in that particular area. So it's just res hoping there's just residents of that community that will be um, partaking in, in, in the, the com constituency motorcade. But I, I need to say again, that every single one of those guidelines that has been articulated must be in effect for the constituency motorcade. And so they still applicable. Uh, Commissioner, and yes. we were saying earlier that at the constituency level, easier for enforcement. Yes. And how many uh, motorcades, constituency motorcades, would the respective parties be allowed? Is there a limit? Yes, um, there, um, there, there is a limit for the um, constituency motorcades. Um, it was one, one constituency motorcade, yes. So a um, person would apply and have one constituency motorcade. However, the main... One per um, week. Yes. However, what we would be um, looking at is that persons do not make a community motorcade into a national motorcade. So we are not expecting, if you have a, a motorcade in a, in a constituency, for example, I, um, I have to, just a name, in a St. James, you have a, a constituency motorcade in St. James, we are hoping that it's only members of the St. James community or constituency to attend and not members of Bridgetown constituency so that it limits the number of vehicles, it limits the number of persons there and it makes policing easier for us. Okay. And now you know you have those large constituencies, you have Grosele, Babano, I could throw it in there, um, as well as Chouazel with all of those inroads and outroads and side roads, back roads. Yeah. <laughs> so within the constituency itself, doing a motorcade can, yeah, as you say, can seem like a national motorcade. And is there a time frame within which the, the motorcade is supposed to be um, out and, and, and the training throughout the constituency? Yes, actually, the, um, upon application, you would uh, give us the time that you intend to um, have your motorcade. However, the motorcade must stop at least one hour before curfew time so that you would give persons an opportunity to get back to their homes uh, before curfew. Mm -hmm. So the curfew is still in effect. Um, we did not extend the curfew. Um, contrary to what persons were circulating, that there was no curfew, the curfew remains in effect at 11 p.m. So at 11, we should not um, have any we should not have any activities in relation to whether it is politics or otherwise, any social event. We're expecting that 11 persons would be out from the streets and into their homes. That's what a, a curfew is. Now, what's a motorcade without music? How does that factor into the no uh, uh, permission for loud music? How does that factor into, into play? Yes, actually, the... Um, we took everything into consideration and uh, the permission for loud speakers for the motorcade. So um, we are still under the, um, under the, the law that mm -hmm. permission would not be given cat blush for um, loud music. However, for the motorcades, it's included in the, um, in the permit that, that we issue. Okay, so we... Uh, Ms. Central Main, you want to jump in? I just wanted to say something um, with respect to, because you asked the question, how different is it um, to the, the national um, motorcade? For um, contact tracing purposes, if there's an issue in 
I don't want to use, I'm being real, <laughs> so I'm just using it arbitrarily, Babono, yeah, if there's an issue with Babono, you know that it is just within the confines of Babono, although contract tracing is never easy, that you would be, you know, doing your, your contact tracing. But if it's a case where it's open to all, so you'd have to be all over the place and that can really prove a challenge. So that is another um, positive, well, <laughs> Uh, I so from that public health yeah, standpoint, from a public health standpoint, it can be you know that that can be a bit easier for us, right? And but and and you're hoping that people would know people in the con in the community, in the community and make it so mm -hmm. so much easier. We we did hear about the registering of names. Um, is that practicable at all? Uh, uh, and uh, is that a responsibility that we're no longer placing on the various uh, political parties? The registering of names were for the office meetings. For office meetings? Office meetings, yes. So because throughout the campaign, there would be a number of office meetings for strategizing and whatever the case may be, planning and so on. So that the, um, the registering of names was for that because we know it, it, it is unrealistic to, <laughs> yes, to have persons register because you, you don't know at what point somebody will join um, with respect to the motorcades, so you cannot realistically expect to have a list of those persons. But for the in-house meetings, we are recommending that um, a list of the names of those persons and the vital information like the address uh, and so on be um, taken into consideration. Now, there is within the protocols, you also have provision there for meals and the handling of meals and so forth. Give us an indication of what that specifies because, you know, as of anything else, at the tradition, you will have the roadside vendor. Um, you may have some um, within the executive of the parties, perhaps having catered meals uh, for um, specific members and so forth. So, what obtains with the meals? Well, let me go to, let me put my public health um, <laughs> part now. So we are expecting that all persons who um, is going to be preparing or serving food must be in possession of a valid health certificate and a public health license. With respect to um, the serving of meals during those events, we are asking or recommending that those meals be self-service, not self-service, but takeaways. Okay, so at no time where you're going to have a buffet style where persons, you know, crowd themselves and so mm -hmm. individuals, maybe the meals will be laid somewhere and individuals in, in, in a, a strategized manner collect their meals and leave or distributed to, to, to the respective persons. So that is the recommendation that if meals are going to be served, that they're going to be takeaways, packaged individually. Now, I know vaccination plays a very key role. Well, it is what is being presented now as the uh, way out of COVID-19, being able to vaccinate your way out of COVID-19. For St. Lucia, um, we have seen that as of the 12th of July, our vaccination numbers, um, 31,340 people receiving just the first dose um, of the AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine. 22,653 have received their second dose. Um, so that is telling within itself. While the numbers, um, yes, we're happy that, it, but it is still lower than what the expected um, numbers should be for us to get anywhere near herd immunity. Uh, so I'll ask you again from your public health uh, standpoint, Ms. St. Romain, um, to talk to us about the importance of vaccination and uh, impress upon St. Lucians why um, the need for us to go out and get vaccinated? Um, at this point in time, the COVID vaccine is the only thing that can protect you from, not necessarily protect you, because um, if you do get it, there are chances that, um, if you are vaccinated, there are chances that you may get. But if you do get um, COVID whilst being vaccinated, um, you are less likely to become sick or you are less likely to die from it, okay? Um, the, the, what's the word? The symptoms, signs and the symptoms will be much milder, okay? Mm -hmm. um, so 
I'm just imploring on everybody, especially during a time like that, that persons utilizing services that is available and get vaccinated. Do it for you, do it for us, do it for your family member, do it for your friend, do it for your loved one. This is the only, we, in order for us to be able to enjoy what we used to enjoy before, to be able to do things without thinking, because that is clearly what, what, what's happening, um, we need to ensure that we get vaccinated. Okay, so make that decision, and the, the, the services are available all over. Um, the, where the locations, the sites and locations where um, the team are, uh, they are always publicized. It, so please, um, persons who are not, take that opportunity to get vaccinated. And we're 11 days away from the uh, polling day. So I will to give that opportunity to the chief, um, the commissioner of police, with your closing remarks, uh, Mr. Milton Daisy, your appeal to the St. Lucian public to adhere to the protocols that we have outlined. Yes, and um, even before I um, appeal to them to adhere, there are certain offenses I think the public needs to know, especially on election day, yes, that uh, persons may be committed. And one of them, the first one on the, um, in the Elections Act is intoxicating liquor not to be sold, supplied or given on polling day. Is, shall not sell, shall not supply, shall not give any, any individual intoxicating liquor because um, for one to cast their vote they need to be sober if any person if it appears to the um, presiding officer that on the day that someone appears to be intoxicated you can order this he or she could order this person out of the building so um, because you cannot cast a vote if you were intoxicated that is one. Also, um, we usually have issues with employers not giving um, individuals the opportunity to vote. That is an offense. Persons um, need, and the law provides that it should be at least two hours, nothing less than two hours. It could be more because someone may be working in castries, but it's registered to vote yeah. in Sufre, and it may take two hours because you spend time on the line and so on so um, it's the law provides that it should not be anything less than two hours um, loudspeakers on the day um, banners signs and so on not permitted on the day of voting um, influencing other persons or other persons to vote or not to vote in any direction it is also an offense um, then there are other offenses in relation to ballot ballot papers etc and um, offenses with respect to the officials who would be conducting that election for example the um, the presiding officers, the poll clerks and so on, there are offenses to them and I am aware that all of them would be trained and would be given the um, information um, as it uh, pertains to the uh, Elections Act. So um, we are just hoping, I'm just hoping and we the police especially, we're responsible for law and order that persons will be sensible on that day and the days before. Respect each and everyone respect person's rights everybody has a right to follow whichever party they want um, respect properties and also there are uh, persons we are, we have been getting reports that persons are destroying all the um, properties of um, individuals if they are not for example posters you are not for this um, individual, you are not supporting the individual, so you destroy it. This is an offense, damage to property, which you could be arrested for. We do not want 
to reach that far. We're just urging persons to do the responsible thing. We know that persons are heated and so on, but everybody just um, be responsible and do things that is not in breach of the law. Also, in terms of the protocols, the health protocols, because this is one of the main issues that we are seeing, that persons contracting the virus and there being an outbreak that we cannot handle, we do not want that. So persons, please enjoy yourself and be responsible. Thank you so much for that. And just to add to what the commissioner just indicated there regarding the law and the election, election day, we will be having a series of interviews um, pertaining to that specifically on the beginning next week. So you'll be able to have all of that information at hand uh, so that especially for the first time voters, we have quite a large number of individuals voting for the first time in this election. So right here in the Information Command Center, you'll be having all of that information, the election law and you, so you can um, stay tuned for that. I want to give a closing moment to the Chief Fire Officer, Mr. Joseph Joseph. Yeah, thank you very much, um, sir. Um, we, we all know that uh, many persons are very passionate about elections. I mean, mm -hmm. once the season comes, you know, that's their time. And, uh, you know, we are, we are all willing to support, you know, the, the venture, but um, we are asking that um, it, everything is done in a, in a safe manner. We need to remember that life continues beyond the election. And um, certainly for those who have not been through it, I mean, you don't know what it is, but to be involved in an accident or, or even to get COVID, for, for example, uh, uh, based on, on some of the things we've heard from persons who have gotten it and survived, uh, it's not a pleasant experience. So um, we are asking everyone to desist from, from the practices that will endanger your life and we spoke about some of them already and some of us sometimes take many things for granted so for example um and we spoke about the the, the trucks carrying several people um these vehicles have to you know sometimes travel some treacherous treacherous paths and we don't know the last time these vehicles were serviced and all of that if one of them goes down a precipice we have some major issues so we are asking persons um, to desist from the practices that, you know, put your life at risk. And remember that uh, COVID has no friends, all right? So uh, irrespective of your party, whether you are a Labour Party supporter, UWP or any other party, if, if you are exposed and, and um, contract COVID, then the, the risk is, you know, just as, as bad to you as it is to everybody else. So, um, we want to ask persons to, you know, remain safe and um, all, all the best for <laughs> me the best, me the, me the best part here. Thank you so much for that, the Chief Fire Officer Joseph Joseph, as well as Commissioner of Police Milton J. Daisy and the Deputy Chief Environmental Health Officer, Mr. Cheryl Eugene St. Romain, for being here with us and discussing the COVID-19 protocols and election campaigning for 2021. And first, remember that it takes personal responsibility to keep you safe out there during this campaigning period. And uh, also, if you contract COVID-19 or you are harmed in any other way, you will not be able to exercise that franchise. So just remember that uh, when you are out there, wear your mask, wear it appropriately, and ensure that you do your social distancing as well as hand sanitizing. I'm Lisa Joseph. See you back here in the Information Command Center.